they're getting my manual so I can follow down the notes with you. Uh, it's been really good to have you here this week. I mean, can you believe we're already at this point? It's Thursday, and man, it's like one more morning tonight and tomorrow morning, and we're done. It's incredible. These things go by so fast. But uh, I don't know if you really sense it or not, but there is a, there is a real change that's coming in the body of Christ, and you can sense it. It's a powerful change. Now, let me get an idea and a scope of who I'm talking to today, and everybody's still filtering. That's the reason I'm going to kind of mess around here until everybody's here. Uh, how many of you are not from America? Okay. Good. How many of you are from a... Before you came to Jesus, you were just a heathen. You didn't know Jesus. I mean, you weren't raised in church or anything. Just a heathen. Uh, now, I'm not talking about you heathens that were raised in church. I'm talking about your basic cold, cold heathen. Okay, good. How many of you that just raised your hand? I'm just taking a little poll here. How many of you have been in church for 20 years or better? Okay. You've been here long enough to be ruined, haven't you? Uh, let's see. Now, how many of you who are raised in church, you're, you're either f second or third generation church person, whether you're whatever denomination it is, but you're a second or third generation? Okay, great. That's a lot of us. So, Now, uh, how many of you are from an evangelical background? That would be Baptist, Methodist, so, so forth. Okay, good. How many of you are from a Pentecostal background, charismatic, word of faith, all that? Okay, good. Wow, what a mix. How many of you are from a liturgical background? Catholic? Episcopal? Oh, I love you guys. No, oh, there's more of you than that. There's lots of folks back there. Excellent. Well, uh, I want to welcome you. And I love this class. I love talking about this because, uh, but only until just recently have I really loved to talk about worship. Uh, it's really an odd thing. The Lord is doing such a brand new thing in me right now that I'm not sure exactly how to express myself. I grew up in the United States. I grew up in a southern state down in Alabama. I was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and I grew up in the south from the time I was probably 10 years old. So I know all about southern hospitality, and I know how slow we are, and, uh, and I like it. But we're not that slow anymore. Everything's really picked up around here, too. But the thing that I, I always felt like, can I just share my heart with you? The thing I always felt like was, God, why did you call me to be a music person? I don't want to be a music person. I don't want to do music. First of all, I was just talking to Benny at lunch, and Benny said, you know, Beethoven was the first musician who was ever allowed to socialize with the aristocrats. Uh, before Beethoven, the musicians were pretty well kept in the kitchen, and they ate with the servants. And they never really mingled with the people who were the movers and shakers of society. They were kind of like, okay, bring the musician on, we want some background music. Or let's see what you've written, let's all go watch it. And a lot of times it gets misinterpreted in our society that, that to be called to be a musician is a glamorous lifestyle. Oh, you know, I, I call them diesel sniffers, you know, people who want to get on a bus and travel. You know, they, they, they want to get free of the mundane and get out there and do something. And, and uh, they just don't know what they're in for. Um, uh, let me give you a secular reference. There is, a, uh, there is a secular music channel called VH1 that has been running. Uh, they made a video available. They're making these videos available. They're running them on their channel, but they're also making them available. And it's called Behind the Music. And I don't know if anybody has seen those, but it talks about the lives of rock and roll stars. And it's almost like you, could, you change the names and the faces, but the story is exactly the same. Everybody's story is identical because they all have a rise to fame because of their gifting and their talent that brings them to a forefront. And they all blow it, lose their money, mess up, get on drugs, wind up in some rehabilitation center, and, you know, big, big rock and roll 80s people now are working at bicycle shops, 
Uh, they're, they're putting up posters. I mean, the people that everybody flocked to by the hundreds of thousands to pay high dollar for their tickets to see them, now they're in nowhere land. And it seems that that is the story of musicians. And uh, sometimes that's the story of church musicians. Uh, because we always feel, and that's the reason I didn't want to be called to be a musician, because I wanted to be a pastor, because that's what really counts. You understand what I'm saying? That's what, in the Western church, that's what really counts. If you're not a pastor or an evangelist, teachers are just a step or two down, and apostles and prophets are non-existent. You know, and I think with the apostles and the prophets went the musicians too. I don't know. But in the church hierarchy that I know in Western civilization, America as I know it, that's the way things are and have been for several years. So you see, I'm a person that I want to do something. I want to spend my life for something that counts. I want to see people saved. I want to be a part of what God is doing. So the last thing I want to be is a musician. Until Brownsville. Until Brownsville. Because things are changing in the body of Christ. There is a, there is a reformation of sorts that's happening. And I think we're only seeing the ripple of it. We haven't gotten to the epicenter yet. We have got a society that is moved, shaken, and formed by popular music stars. It's moved, shaken, and, for shaken and formed by the internet, by media, by music, and entertainment. And it's across the board. If you go to Russia, it's the same thing. There is an enamoring effect over in Russia when I was there last of popular music, especially American popular music and British popular music. It seems that the stars are made and created and these have become our role models for our children. Instead of a fireman, instead of a policeman, and Lord knows instead of the President of the United States, right now nobody wants to be any of those, they want to be a musician. And they want to be that because of what the popular society is pushing. And see, the popular society makes gods of these people. And they live a persona that is really not who they are, but it's who they want you to think they are, to sell whatever records they want to sell. We were just talking again at lunch about Karen Carpenter and the Carpenters, and we were talking about a, a video we'd seen on their life and how tragic it was. But in the 1970s, the Carpenters had a squeaky clean persona because that sold their records. While behind the scenes, I can't remember his name, I don't remember Karen. He's really got to feel bad about that, you know? Richard, oh, Richard who? Uh, no. Richard is an alcoholic, drug addict, his life is falling apart, his sister has anorexia, and their lives are just living hell. But from the outside looking in, and what we're led to believe in popular society, everything is okay. It's a great life. The same of the Jackson Five. And all of those guys from the 70s that had that squeaky clean persona that we thought this is a family-oriented kind of thing. And as it began to open up more and more, we saw all the nasty truth. And the sad thing is that it parallels sometimes in the church because musicians, we musicians are the kind of people that most of the rest of people would like to figure out what to do with. We're not very conforming, and sometimes we get proud of the fact that we're not conforming. We conform to nonconformity. It's something about the creative, we were talking about it again at lunch today, and I'm going to get, this is my introduction, it's not even what I'm talking about, but I just want to get this out. I have to talk about what I'm thinking about. But it's like a husband and a wife 
How many of you men have ever looked at your wife and you've explained something to her three times that's perfectly logical to you, but she just doesn't quite get it? And she looks at you and go, goes, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Why are you thinking like that? Anybody can see that it's da 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 And you look at her and go, I've never heard such a weird story in all my... What are you thinking? What, what, what side of the brain are you thinking of to think of that? It's the way that she's processing thought and the way you're processing thought is so far apart. I think the same distance is put between the corporate world and the art world. Because the corporate world doesn't understand how the art world thinks. Thus we have this huge gulf between pastors and music people. Because pastors have risen in the Western society because the church has moved into a corporate layout. It's ran more like corporations. Everybody's business suited and they've all got their computers and they've got their time clocks and they've got their hours and so forth And it's ran that way and I'm sure there's very very good reasons for it to be ran that way, but In a musician creative person's brain that just doesn't go anywhere. I remember for three years I worked at a church that was very corporately or organized and I felt very compelled to try to do the corporate thing so I put on my tie I went to the office every morning at 830 I got in there got my cup of coffee and did nothing all day long because my door is open and I am a people person and every person that walked by my door would go hey I could be in the middle of writing something, you know, writing a piece, writing, which I, I have to concentrate on, you know. I'm in the middle of it. Hey, man, how you doing? Well, there it went, you know, and for two hours I sit there, you know, trying to get back on track, you know. I'm like, oh, man. And so I would, I would wait, literally. I was single. I didn't have a life. So I waited until 4.30 till everybody left. I basically went from office to office drinking coffee all day long. And tried to figure out who would buy my lunch that day. And then, <laughs> and then at 4.30, I would start working on my music. And I would work to about 9 o'clock and get my music done. Because I couldn't do it with all that, that thing. But I was trying to do the corporate thing. And it almost killed me. Because I was pulling double shift. Because I'm a different person. And I think that what I would love to see happen in the church is a realization and an appreciation of the differences rather than trying to bring everyone into conformity because I believe God created every snowflake different so he's not afraid of someone a little different if we can come under come together under the common agreement that Christ is Lord and that it was he was buried and he rose he was born of a virgin and he's coming back for his church when we get to minor differences I think those need to be laid down and that's something that that works from both sides of the fence. Now I've been talking from the musician side, let me, I mean from the pastoral side, let me talk from the musician side. I understand how both brains work because I've done a little bit of both. Musicians could use to be a little more faithful and a little more conforming. It doesn't hurt you every once in a while to violate some of your high ideas. Like I remember one time I was working at a church in California and the pastor believed in 6.30 a.m. prayer meetings. He was obviously not a musician. <laughs> he had been to some seminar somewhere and they had said, we are having a great big church built and we have 6.30 prayer. So he came home and decided to put Saul's armor on us. I can't even, I don't like anybody at 6.30. A morning person I'm not. I don't get out of the bed and go, oh, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for the day. You know, I'm more alive about midnight. You know, when everybody's going to sleep, I start thinking. And I start going, you know, and, and that's when I want to create. That's when I want to pray. That's when I want to, I mean, because it's late. Everything's quiet. So he came in and said, now we're all going to be here. So I drug in for about three weeks, 6.30. And finally I said, look, you're going to have to hear from God another way because I'm telling you, this is killing me. He pinned me the wall and he said, look, 
you are under my employment, you will be here at 6.30. And I'm telling you, that's hard for a musician sometimes. But see, that's where we have to go. He's the pastor. It's what he said. Let's do it. Be happy about it. So what I found out is it's better not to go to bed. He was real lenient on office hours, so what I would do is just stay up all night and come to, and that was the last thing I did in my day. I'd go to 6.30 prayer meeting, then go home and go to bed. Felt like a vampire. I was sleeping all through the day and up all night. <laughs> Woo, that was scary. But I am making a point here, if you'll hang with me. We all have to trace back this, this, this schism that Satan continually works between musicians and worshipers and pastors and the fivefold ministry of the church, we have to understand that there's a diabolical meaning behind it. It's not just something that is natural or in nature or character driven. It is a diabolical plan to pit us against one another. Pastors I talk to are so frustrated with their musicians, so frustrated with their worship leaders. Musicians and worship leaders I talk to are so frustrated with their pastors. I want to lead us into da 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 da, and he don't want to go there. He still wants to do that. Well, the first thing I had to say is we are going to soon get over the idea that everything that happens in this building is the church. This is not the church, nor is this the only piece of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at the grocery store, in the mall, when you're shopping, when you're walking day to day to day to day. And what you are out there in the streets is more important than what you do on Sunday morning. And I'm telling you, if the only gig a musician has is playing on Sunday morning, he's probably not great, a great musician because he's not really playing very much. You've got to be expressing yourself to the Lord other places than just always, this is my thing. Because when this is the only thing we focus on, when Sunday morning becomes the focus of the week to the point that we don't see the kingdom of God daily, all the time, throughout the land, then what we do is we start fighting for our little position in the kingdom. And a schism starts happening, and we start getting mad at each other, and we start pitting at each other, and we get mad because the pastor doesn't give us enough time to lead worship, and the pastor gets mad because we took more time than we were offered. And we want to sing rock and roll, and he wants us to sing hymns. And all the old folks in the church want to hear whatever they liked when they were teenagers. And for some folks, that was a long time ago. Isn't it funny how we make sacred the things we liked when we were teenagers? You know, it's a, it's a proven fact that most, mu most people quit listening to popular music or what is considered the new music when they're about in their mid-20s. And they kind of roman romanticize over the music they listen to through their teens and early 20s, and they just kind of stop there. Like right now, I'm at that age where everything in the 80s sounded good. And what is this now? You know what I mean? I'm right there. It's like, what is this stuff we're playing now? Where is the melodies? I mean, where is the melodic thing? It's just really bad garage bands. You know? Are really good musicians trying to play really bad? And you just, but, but what you do is you can't stop there. You can't allow yourself to stop creating because it's not what you like. And that's the thing that grandmother, my grandmother learned, but every grandmother and grandfather in the church needs to understand that things keep moving on. God keeps moving on. God creates everything. Satan perverts everything. God created the music. Satan perverted the music. And we can't take something and make it holy that was created or perverted by Satan. Created by God and perverted by Satan. And there's a great debate has been raging in the church for years. That doesn't sound very holy. While a pipe organ sounds holy to us. But in Charles Spurgeon revivals, a pipe organ was so evil sounding that he was asked not to preach in churches. He had to go to theaters because he brought that wretched pipe organ. And it sounded like demons screaming from hell. 
that awful pipe organ that every mainline church in the world now worships and calls sacred. And now it's those wretched guitars scream like the demons of hell. Give us 30 years and they'll be holy. They're in transition. They're in hell, but we're going to redeem them. But you see, I'm, I'm kind of having fun, but I'm trying to lay a foundation for you to understand that, that we are all susceptible to this, even me. I'm finding, I graduated in 1981. I know I don't look 36, but I am. And I don't act 36, I don't think, but that's every man's idea too. But I tend to look back at the things fondly as a boy and try to camp there, but I won't let myself. Because, not because I'm trying to be cool or not because I'm trying to be relevant, because I don't believe God is always relevant. Sometimes He goes against the grain, against the culture, against all those things. But I believe musically, the body of Christ, I've seen an opening happen here at Brownsville that I didn't think was possible here. This church has been so tolerant. And yes, I said the word right, tolerant. The leadership of this church has been tolerant. The workers in this church have been tolerant. The pastor of this church has been tolerant. Because I know, I remember when I first came to Brownsville, somebody, oh, somebody, nothing like falling in front of everybody. So much for pride. Somebody walked up to me and was going to explain to me the kind of music that I shouldn't play at Brownsville. And they meant it well. They're a very good friend of mine, and I, and I really appreciated the gesture. But about midway in the sentence, I said, really, don't tell me anymore. Because if you tell me I can't do a style of music, and I feel like we need to go that direction, I'm going to be rebelling. I'm going to be directly rebelling what I know is accepted at Brownsville. Now, if you don't tell me about it, and then we just do it, and God blesses it, it'll be cool. I won't feel rebel. I won't feel like I'm rebel. I will not. Let me tell you something I know about musicians. Because we are stealing Satan's position, we are stealing his position. He forfeited it, and we're taking it. He fights us harder than anybody else. Now, I know pastors find that hard to believe, but musicians... We're always frontline people in battles in the Old Testament. And today, we're still frontline people. We are not just song service anymore. We're not 20 or 30 minutes, get it out of the way, make us all happy, get us all in a good mood so I can preach the word and we can get the offering. That day is over. It's done. Now, mind you, if my pastor says you got 30 minutes, I go 30 minutes. But my pastor doesn't do that. Thank you, Lord. He says, go till you're done. And if you'll notice, he and Steve are not always jumping up and running over me. Because they respect me. And I respect them. If God gives them something, let it go. But we've had to earn that respect from one another. It wasn't something just in... It was just there. We were all so dumbfounded by what God was doing in Brownsville that we just went... Wow. Wow. I believe there's, and I don't minimalize the preaching of the word either, pastors. I believe in the preaching of the word. We have to have it. Has to have a foundation. But the scripture that gets left out a lot of times is, the Bible says the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. If you have too much spirit and not enough word, you got crazy folks. If you got too much word and not enough spirit, you got lazy folks. Because they're all sleeping. How the Word of God is quick and powerful when it's spoken with the anointing and the unction of the Holy Spirit, when it's spoken under roteness and just because we're supposed to. I mean, if you want to put yourself to sleep, pick up the Bible. Because Satan so much doesn't want you to get the Word of God in you, he just lets you get real sleepy when you start to read it. But when the Spirit of God is quickening it to you, it becomes quick and powerful and full of life. 
So there's a marriage that has to happen. It also has to happen between the music and the word. And I personally believe that the fivefold ministry of the church is also fulfilled through music. And a lot of people would differ with me on that. But I really believe, let me get my, now I'll get back to my notes. Now settle down, I've meddled long enough. I believe apostles, pastors, prophets, teachers, and evangelists. I believe music can play a role in all five of those ministries. Just as we have a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist, an apostle, and a prophet. I also know that there is music that is evangelistic, pastoral, prophetic, apostolic. There is all branches of music to fit all branches of the church. But a lot of musicians have not functioned in that because they haven't understood it. And a lot of times pastors have not known what to do with it. There's a new thing happening. I have never seen so many musicians rising up out of nowhere, out of total obscurity with a fresh word of the Lord in their mouth, a fresh anointing, a fresh song that God is birthing all over his kingdom in the world today. And it's so funny how God is doing it and it's beginning to break down walls. Another thing that's really unique about music is it crosses over denominational barriers like nothing else can. If you have a Pentecostal preacher trying to preach in a Catholic church, he may or may not be accepted. But if you have a believer who's singing worship songs at a Catholic church, it will be a lot more accepted than would a spoken word. So it's, it's almost like a forerunner. Now let's parallel that to what's going on in the world. The world's prophet is its music. You can always hear what's coming in the way of lifestyle about three years in advance if you listen to what is cutting edge right this minute. Example, the sexual, sexual revolution as they call it, the experimental age of the 60s was prophesied in the music of the late 50s because suddenly rock and roll was on the scene and it started off with doo wop wop doo wop wop doo doo wop da da tutti frutti. I mean, stuff like that. Just innocent little tutti frutti doo wop bop songs. You know? That kind of stuff. Just innocent. But as it moved closer to the 60s, it started prophesying necking, making out. And the music got more and more lewd in its content. It was prophesying to the generations, now we need to move into this. The early 60s music began to be experimental with drugs. It began to pro that you need to get on a high, and, and half of America didn't even know what a high was in the beginning of the 60s. But music introduced it and prophesied that it would happen. If that's the case, we've got a scary prophet in our face right now with gangster rap and with what's out there in the streets that's being prophesied because it's being prophesied as anarchy and it's being prophesied as a total decay of society in the music right now. Well, I gotta ask you a question, pastors and musicians. Why is it that the world's music will prophesy the coming events and all of we Christian and musicians are always trying to find a new choir song from somebody else who's worn it out 15 years? Why are we prophesying what God's kingdom is about to come into? Why are we speaking in the kingdom of God and talking about what God is about to do and proclaiming his work among the nations and proclaiming his glory among the heathen? Because we've got the spirit of fear and because Satan has covered our mouth and covered our hands and confused us and decided that he's got us in a pocket where we will stay out of his way. Because when the children of God begin to lift up a sound in unity and the music and the worship leaders begin to lift up a voice in unity and the pastors and the evangelists all lift up that sound in unity, the heavens begin to shatter and Satan's strongholds begin to fall and then when the man of God steps up with the word of God, the barriers are broken. Now, I have let, I've done a very unmusician thing in this revival. I have let 
everybody else tell me what I do. Because I so much want to stay out of the way. I don't want to know really what I'm doing. Sometimes when God is using you, it's better if you stay really stupid. It really is. It's better if you don't know. Because if you know, you'll mess it up. Excuse me. Welcome to the South. Pollen City. It's also, I've fallen in front of you. I figured blowing my nose ain't a big deal. Man, when you got sinus, it just keeps coming, don't it? Forgot it. Uh, it's better if... <laughs> we can be real, can't we? It's better if, if you don't really realize what God is doing with you. Because I step out of here every night to worship the Lord, and I really try to, I try to push the people out of my mind, not that I'm being abusive, but I try to focus really on what the Lord is doing that, at that moment with me. Because I can't lead you where I haven't been. And if I'm not a worshiper, I can't expect you to worship. And I'm willing to come out here and be a fool in front of you. And most nights I am very much a fool in front of everybody. Some nights I dance and look at the video and think, oh, Lord. I hope nobody sees that, you know. But it's because I'm exampling to you my personal relationship in worship to the Father. Not that you will imitate me, but that you will be freed to worship the Lord as you feel that you should, rather than feeling like you've got to stay inside a particular box. And people have come up to me since the beginning of this revival and said, Linda, do you realize what you're doing? I said, no, I don't really, I don't, I, you tell me. You're breaking down, and I said, wait a minute, let's clear that up. If anything's being broken down, the Lord is breaking it down. But the Lord through you is breaking down strongholds and setting people free before Steve ever gets up there. So that when Steve gets up and delivers the hard word that he delivers, people's hearts are ready to receive. I said, well, thank you. And I kind of just left, you know, I don't read a lot of the stuff that, that's been out there in the last three or four years that's written about the revival. Again, if it's negative or if it's positive. If it's positive, I'll get the big head. If it's negative, I'll get depressed. So I'm better off just leave it alone. You know, if people don't like me, they just don't like me. Can't help it. I spent, my dad is here, he's a pastor up in North Alabama. I worked in his church for 26 years, and I had to kill myself trying to please people. I mean, my dad, we always had to drive an old car, because if you drove too nice of a car, people wouldn't pay you any money. I got my first set of drums, and I couldn't bring them to church for six months because I had to say they were old after I got them to church because people would think that the pastor was getting rich and buying his kid all these fine toys. I couldn't play a hymn because it was too high and mighty. I had to play those camp meeting Pentecostal songs because that's all anybody knew. I remember when we did the first worship song. Now, for heaven's sake, it was the Word of God we were singing. The Word of God. And I had to beg to sing it the first time because everybody was afraid that it would offend everybody in the church because I was singing the Word of God to a melody. And it was some, one of those real goofy charismatic songs from back in the 80s. We had some real goofy ones. But they, you know what? They stuck. You know, you got the Word of God in you anyway, goofy as they were. I forgot what it was. Um, Biting in the Vine or something, one of those little tutti fruity sounding things. And, and man, you would not believe. I've spent my entire life trying to please folks. And I, I, I tell you where it brought me. Five, year, five years ago, it brought me to shipwreck. It brought me to, as a, a bitter, mean, hard, sick of church, sick of people, who had decided that God was really good and I was getting out of the church. Well, before this revival began, I was to a place where I wanted out of the church. I was tired of working for pastors who was trying to get me to fit into something I couldn't fit into. 
And I decided the smarter thing for me to do is just go get a job and wait tables because I could see the kingdom of God come just as fast through waiting tables and telling people about Jesus as I could entertaining a bunch of people with a choir on Sunday morning. That's where I was. Now, that's not all right. <laughs> it's just where I was. That doesn't make it right for me to have that attitude, but that's where I was when God touched me. And I, I thought, God, there has to be more. There has to be more to your church than a fuss and a fight over some style of music. Why did you have to make me a musician? Why did you have to let me be a musician? Why couldn't I have been someone that everybody liked? Martyrdom, you know, I was in martyrdom. Woe is me. When God touched me, and only recently, I'm telling you, God touched me back in 95, but I'm telling you, only in the last month or two have I really learned to appreciate the role God has given me here. Because I really just thought, man, I'm in Brownsville, we'll get this over with, and then I can go pastor a church. Because I was called to preach when I was 17, and my heart is to pastor. And it always has been. But I found out myself behind the keyboard going, what is this? I don't want to do this job. Nobody likes this job. And then I would see the Lord begin to show me and put people around me and let me see so many brothers and sisters come into the revival and they were so empty and so tired and, and they, had, they had been through the same thing and I was able to minister to them because of my own situation I've been through. But God touched me in 1995 in an incredible way and changed my life. Now, all that was my introduction. Let me get to what I want to say. In the last two months, God has totally changed my attitude about worship. Completely changed my attitude. Now, I understand we started at 1.30, and I've got till quarter to, th quarter to three. No, that's not right. Is that right? So if you, anybody else leaves, I'm going to throw a songbook at you. No, I'm kidding. I, I have so much to say, and I don't know if I can get it all in. I'm going to try to really, really go fast. Will anybody be terribly, terribly offended with, you, with me if I don't go through every single scripture? I'm going, to re, I'm going to allude to the scriptures. You can do your homework. Uh, we're all pastors and ministers here. I'm not talking to unbelievers that don't think I'm biblically based. I'll give you all my biblical basis for what I'm doing. Jesus said when he prayed, the disciples came to him, and I'm not going to turn to this scripture of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, but you know, you know which one we're talking about. It's also in Mark, I believe. Jesus, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, how shall we pray? Teach us to pray. And the Lord said, okay, you pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. Pray like this. That doesn't mean pray this prayer over and over and over, but pray like this. Pray first by worshiping and then entering into agreement with the kingdom of God. Now, I want to say something about the kingdom of God that's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine right now because we've had so much abuse in that area. I don't know if any of y'all have been through that, but the kingdom now teaching and all that kind of thing got a little bit wacky, and we all got a little bit afraid of the word kingdom because it's been kind of thrown around real loosely like the word faith. You know, there's certain things in the body of Christ that's been thrown around so much that it's had so much abuse attached to it that we kind of shriek back from it. But remember this, Jesus came to begin building the kingdom of God on earth. That's what he came for. That's what he was all about. He said, I'm about my father's business. And he was always parabling and always talking in stories going, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, and it's where the first is last and the last is first. It's where the small is great and the great is small. If the kingdom is upside down, it's been called, or it's backwards, or it's different. It's the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So I started thinking about that, and I began to read a book that really opened my eyes. Turn to Revelation with me. This is wonderful. I asked myself if 
if God is praying, if Jesus is praying and he's saying, he's saying, may your kingdom come, may your will be done. What is he saying? And I begin to realize that we worship here on earth, and worship here on earth is like a rehearsal for what's going to happen in heaven. The real worship is happening in heaven, around the throne of God, with the cherubims and the seraphims and the 24 elders and the saints. That's where real worship is going on, what I'm saying, the model worship. That's where the thing is happening. What we're doing on earth, what I'm doing when I stand behind a keyboard is I'm imagining with my mind's eye, Paul called it seeing through a glass darkly. I'm imagining what it will be like when I can actually worship. I'm doing everything in my being to worship here. You understand what I'm saying? I'm giving it all I got. I'm lifting my hands. I'm shouting. I'm dancing. I'm worshiping. But in my mind, I'm visualizing being in the throne room of God, trying to get a grasp on what it is. And the only idea I have is in revelation of what, what worship in the throne room of God is like. And uh, let's go to Revelation 5. Verse 6. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. I wonder who that was standing in the center of the throne and encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns, seven eyes, and se uh, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to the churches, sent out to, unto all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain and your blood was purchased men unto God, and so on and so on and so forth. Every time, almost every time in Revelation, as you can study this out again, I'm not going to go through all the scriptures, but every time you look at this glimpse of worship going on in heaven, you find the elders, my elders are my favorite, because you always find them falling down. They're always falling down. Every time, the, you know, and, the, and the 24 elders fell down and, and laid their crowns at the feet of the Lord. There's always something happened. And the thing that you look into when you see it in heaven, too, is it's everybody was participating. There was no one spectating. Everybody was involved. Everybody was worshiping. The cherubims and the seraphims, the four living creatures and the 24 elders and the saints and the host were all worshiping the Lord. Now, if that is a picture of what worship is in heaven, then Jesus said, may it be on earth as it is in heaven. Doesn't that make worship really an interesting thing compared to the way we've practiced it for years? Now, we've done all we know. Give, we'll give you that. And I give me that. I've done what I've known to do. But what I see modeled in heaven as worship unto the Lord. And by the way, God is, God is teaching his bride right now. There is a surge of worship going on in the world, in the church, that's amazing. I have, like I said, I've never seen so much worship, so much hunger for worship, that people are just rising up with all this hunger to worship. People who never worshipped like that before. Do you know that in America, I don't know if it's happening around the world, but in America, many of our evangelical churches have added on a contemporary worship service that they call a more free-flowing type of worship. I've actually participated in some of those. And what we're calling in the evangelical church a contemporary church service is more like what we're doing here. It's because there's this hunger that's coming. And why do you think it's coming? I'll give you an idea. It's so that the church will know so well how to worship the bridegroom that when Jesus comes, we'll know what he looks like. We'll know who to look for. And we'll also know how to worship him. The scripture 
Uh, give us an innuendo of 30 minutes of silence somewhere. We got an idea about 30 minutes of silence. I always thought, wondered what that was. And I thought, well, maybe that's when all the folks who never worshipped when they were on earth, when they got to heaven, they go, whoa. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that everything on the earth is like a pattern of something in heaven? of Christ and the bride, of husbands and wives, of, of God and His Son, of, of fathers and their sons and mothers and their sons, and then of the church and of worship that goes on in the throne of God. Now, I'm telling you I'm alive with this in the last four months. I'm telling you I'm alive with it. And I'm suddenly realizing I don't mind being a worship leader. I don't mind because I'm going to have a job when we get to heaven. Nobody else will. No more pastors, no more preachers, no more evangelists, no more prophets, no more teachers. But everybody's going to worship. It's job security. Now I'm joking. Y'all, I'm having fun. I really am. Please don't let me, don't ever think the idea that I'm bashing pastors because my father's a pastor and I worked with him for years. I admire pastors. I'm just saying that God is birthing something new in the church. And it all came from his heart to begin with. It was his desire that we worship him. Now, a lot of these things you've heard before. But God, let's look at something. Here is God in heaven. I used to believe that God needed our worship. But isn't that a little bit proud of me? Isn't that a little bit arrogant of us? To think that God really needs our worship. He's omniscient, omnipotent, all wise, all knowing. He don't need anything. Right? So why, why would he contend with man? I think because more than any of us know, it's not what he needed, it's what he wanted. It wasn't to meet some emotional void he had. He doesn't have any emotional voids. His only problem is us. He has no problems but this, these, this ragtag bunch called his children <laughs> trying to figure it out. You know what I mean? <laughs> he gives us a little bite of the puzzle and then we figure out another bite and, you know, we're just stumbling through. We're trying to find all the, you know, it's so funny. I, I believe it was Finney said that one sure sign of revival was a conversion every two weeks, a reconversion. He said, in order to be in revival on a continuous basis, you have to be reconverted every two weeks. And what he was saying is, you've got to always be getting more and more of the Lord and closer and closer and allowing yourself to be wide open to the Spirit of God to give you fresh revelation. And it's almost like when God brings you to something new, you go, I didn't know anything before, but wow, can you believe this? Oh, I thought I knew something, but no, look at this. And God just moves us from glory to glory to glory to glory and the revelation of, of, of Jesus Christ and of the character of Christ in us. And that's what God's up to. But... Imagine God. I mean, here, if it's, it's so impossible for our little pea brains to even imagine God. But imagine, here's God, just the creator of everything. He spoke, and there it was. He said, man, and there it is. He said, woman, and there she is. She said, beast of the field, and, and daylight and dark, everything. He just said it, and it was, it was, it was. And the universe is beyond our own universes. They say there's 500 million or billion of them besides our own. Wow. He didn't mess around, did he? Here he is in all of this glory. And he decides to make a man in his own image. Now, scripturally, that's the only being that he made in his own image. You and I are in the image of God, created in the image of God. And when God breathed on Adam, the scripture says Adam in the first uh, second, first second chapter of Gen Genesis it said that Adam became a living soul. Now it doesn't say that about any other creature, but it says Adam became a living soul. And God began to talk with Adam daily. And I really believe God was programming Adam. I believe he was going, okay, Adam, let me just let you know more and more and more. Because, you know, we, we know that we don't use our full brain capacity. Some of us use more than others. I think, what did Einstein use, 4 or 5% of, of his entire 
capacity as brilliant. Lord, where does that put me? Oh, my. Oh, Lord. Especially in math. Not, not my good subject. History, I like. Math, <laughs> that's for the thinkers. I, let me. But, you know, the thing of it is, is God was pouring himself into Adam. And Adam naming all the animals. I mean, that's a brilliant feat in itself. Just naming all the animals. He did it. God bring him and say, oh, we call that a giraffe. Giraffe, all put off, whatever. Every bug. I mean, God's, Adam's naming. And God is going, okay, I finally got what I want. Here is my friend who walks with me, looks like me. I'm teaching him to think like me. And I've given him, every, given him everything he needs in the garden. I've even given him a helpmate. I've given him a lady. And then Adam blows it big time because he wants the thing he can't have. The one thing God said no to. Now I want you to see what happens to God in this situation. We always look at the human tragedy always. Sometimes our soul winning becomes more motivated by human tragedy more than heartbreak of God. And I believe that's what God is changing in the church. Last night when I was singing Here is Love Vast as the Ocean, I read about Evan Roberts and the Wales Revival and a lot of those great revivals. Do you know that the big thing that was popular or that was noted in those great revivals of the past is people would become overcome with emotion at the thought of the Savior dying on the cross for them. And that's something I'm really asking God to give us now. Because it seems we get more concerned about going to hell than we do heartbroken over the Son of God dying and bearing our sin for us. And I look at the heartbreak of God. It starts right there. Isn't it amazing how something so small as man and insignificant as man can break the heart of the most almighty being in the universes or in time or in the expanse of time. Isn't that amazing? Adam and Eve failed and God was separated because of sin from his creation. Now you read the Bible in this frame of mind from the heartbreak of God rather than from what's in it for me and it'll change your life. And that's what's happened to me started reading down through Exodus and the law. I started reading the prophets. And I saw how that God would not even let Moses put the, mint, the tent of meeting into the camp of the Israelites because they were so full of sin. But God wanted to be right in the middle of their camp. But he couldn't because they would not obey. The scripture called them a stiff-necked people. Moses would go to the, the mountain and commune with God and the earth would shake and, and, and the people would stand at the doorway of their house and shake, scared to death. They didn't like the way Moses looked, so they made him cover himself with a veil because you scare us with the way you look when you come out of the glory of God. Again, further rejecting the Lord. After the Red Sea crossing, what a mighty time. I can believe the heart of God began to rejoice a little bit when he saw Miriam get the tambourine and the children and the women of Israel start to dance and sing a song of victory. I think God started going, I think they may be getting it. I think they may be getting it. But then we look a few scriptures later, and now we're grumbling. We're complaining. We're making golden calves. And God's going, I've had it. Done. Get out of the way, Moses. They're gone. I'm through. I've had it. I created them to worship me. They won't. You're it, Moses. Stand back. And God, and I see Moses, you know, uh, 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 excuse me, sir. Uh, you know, you don't quite speak up to God, you know. Uh, uh, you promised that you would make a great nation of them. If you're going to kill them, kill me. God says, you know I can't kill your Moses. You're righteous. And throughout that time, listen to, listen to what the children of Israel had. They had that, the glory, that cloud was going with them every day. 
they would see that physical cloud, the manifestation of the presence of God Almighty in their camp, every, outside of their camp every day. Did you know that? And at night, there would be a fire in the midst of the cloud. That they, every day. You see, God was still making himself visible, trying to make himself accessible to the people. But they would not go that way. And it further breaks God's heart so much that he withdraws himself. And he only sends prophets. And the prophets are all martyred. The final straw is at the end of the prophets. There's a prophet named Hosea. And God says to Hosea, Hosea, I want you to marry a prostitute. Because I want you to live out your life showing my people what it is for me to be married to them. To the point we get to the end of the Old Testament, there's complete 400 years of nothing. God shuts his mouth and everything's silent. And then Jesus comes into the earth. Jesus comes to the world. God is reaching again through his own flesh and blood. His own self sending it and allowing the sacrifice. And here's what the Lord said to me one day. He said, Lyndall, tell me, what's hindering you now from knowing me? I've done all I can. It's up to you now. I've given you the keys of death, hell, and the grave because I gave them to Jesus and I've put everything under his feet and therefore it's under your feet. I've given you every opportunity. Now what will you do with it? And I'm telling you, the last three or four months, God has broken my heart because I realized that David worships seven times a day. I have a tough time doing it three times a day. One time a day. And I'm not getting into legalism. I'm just telling you, I'm starting to see the heart of the Savior broken for me. And it humbles me to such a place that I, worship is not about a few songs anymore. It's not about what goes on in the church service on Sunday. And, I'm, and, and please forgive me if I sounded in the beginning a little edgy. I don't mean to. But I'm so beyond that. I'm past it. I don't care what happens on Sunday morning. I don't care if the choir knows their material. Yeah, I rehearse. You saw us rehearsing tonight, so we'll have it together because I believe that you should study and show yourself approved that you don't be ashamed. You know, you can get really ashamed when 120 people don't know the song. It can be a disaster. But I'm telling you, that's not my motivation anymore. I used to go to pastor's conferences. I used to go to music conferences, and I'd go home, and I'd go try to do all the stuff they did because I wanted our church to grow. And I realized that God really didn't care about my church. He cares about his kingdom. And as long as my church fits in his kingdom, he'll use it. If he don't, he'll let it dry up. He has no obligation. Why has God allowed Brownsville to be used the last few years? Because we backed up and accidentally got in God's way and he ran over us. We didn't plan it. We just got hungry. And we had a pastor in a church that was just hungry. That just said, you know, we got a beautiful building. We got a big choir. We got an orchestra. Everybody in the district is looking at us going, oh, that church is the model of success. And our, part, our pastor walks in in the middle of the night, as he told you last night, slings his keys on the altar and says, God, I'm through. I don't want this. I want you. And you see, when we say things like that to God, and we really mean it, see, remember, God knows when you're putting on. He knows when you're fixing up a face for him. He knows when your heart is really in it. And when that, when that heart of repentance turns to God and says, Father, I think I'm getting a clue that all you've wanted me to do is worship you. All these years, that's all you've wanted me to do. You haven't wanted me to be a great preacher or a great musician. Yes, you teach me to study. I love when pastors study. Lord, help us if they get up and preach and they have it. It can really be a sad thing. But I'm talking to all of you who are seasoned in the church. I'm not talking to unsaved people right now. I'm talking to those of us. I've been in church. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit when I was five years old. I'm 36. I've been a Pentecostal for 29 years, glory to God. 
I'm not talking to heathens this, this afternoon. I'm talking to us, the church. And I'm saying, and I'm confessing before you that I really don't know how to worship. Not like it is in that book. If that is real worship, I'm just learning. I don't even know how to do that. Because I'm still too worried about what you think about me. As wild as I am, I'm still worried about what you think. Because <laughs> i got a little dignity, of course. After I've blown my nose and fallen in front, I've still got some left. Just hang on. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm hearing the heartbeat of the Lord. And I'm saying, Lord, how can I worship you? Will you show me how? You know, I can't even do the second greatest commandment, love my neighbor as myself. I'm having a tough enough time with number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And number two is really hard because there's some of my neighbors I'm not particularly fond of. There's a lady down the street from us who the Lord, she feels like the Lord has appointed her to be the neighborhood lawn police. And if you don't mow your yard and keep your shrubs cut and everything done just so, she will send an anonymous letter. My neighbor's got one is the reason I know. And the little woman came over just to cry and her heart was broken. She said, they said they wanted us out of this neighborhood. Do you know who wrote it? I said, well, it wasn't us. She said, I know my yard looks bad. I said, that's true. But I would never wish you out of the neighborhood because they're very sweet people. They just don't care about a yard. But she just feels like it's her job and her appointment in, in life to just fix everything. I had a car that the Lord had dealt with me to give away to somebody. And I, I bought another car and drove another car. And, and it was about it was an old, old lady's car or something. And so I had parked it out in front of my house trying to ask the Lord which, who I should give it to. And uh, it... I was asking the Lord a little too long for her. I got wind by my other neighbor. It's really fun. My it's like little gossip, you know. He said, Lindo, you know, we really like you. We want you to know that what's her face down there is getting ready to get a city, or a city ordinance against you to make you move that car out of front of your house because it's parked on the street. And there's a, there's a neighborhood thing that says you can't park your car on the street. I said, oh, thank you. So I hurried up, moved it over somewhere, and then gave it away. And, but it, I don't love her that much. You know, she's broke the heart of one of my neighbors. And then I got an eyeline pilot who lives across the way from me who tried to build a little makeshift garage to put his extra car in. It, it wasn't beautiful, but it wasn't bad. She had a city ordinance sign put in his yard that he was not, he was in violation of city ordinance number da-da-da-da-da. And that anybody in the neighborhood who wanted to know information about what was going on, they put a phone. And I thought, Lord, we have, we have tarred and feathered one of our neighbors. And, you know, it's just, I got to tell you, I don't really love that woman too much. Does anybody know what I'm saying? I mean, let's all quit being so religious a minute. I really don't want her to go to hell. Unless she would put an ordinance thing in my yard. <laughs> but then the Bible has to say something like, love your neighbors yourself. I mean, number one's hard. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I can't love her. And the Lord said to me, he said, Lindo, you don't have it yet on the kingdom. I said, what's that? He said, you know the part about allowing yourself to be the last in line and having two coats and giving one away? He said, I'm really trying to make the character of Christ come alive in you. And if you will allow that to happen, you'll understand that you don't have to do it. You have to let me do it through you. Well, I begin to think about that and think, well, you know, if that's the case, then why is it that God can't put worship in me that he really wants to hear? Because he knows what he needs to hear. Sometimes I just, all I know how to do is do hallelujah, praise the Lord, and just anything I can come up with at the moment, right? But God knows what he wants to hear from me, doesn't he? Well, don't that make things a lot easier when you back up and go, all right, God, I don't know how to do this. 
But I want you, I want to tell you that right now I just open my heart and my mind and my spirit to you, and anything you give me, I'll do it. Be careful about that prayer. Whatever you want me to say, I'll say it. No matter how foolish I look to some people. Because I'm here to please you. And it's what's wonderful is you can't please men and God at the same time anyway. And if you please the Lord, you'll eventually get along with people. Eventually they'll get a clue. But the point I'm making is, if God can make me love my neighbor and through me love my neighbor, because I start seeing my neighbor, that lady with all those ordinances, when I start seeing her, th her through Jesus' eyes, and I see that that's another one of his children that he just wants to love, and he wants to fix, and he wants to heal, and he wants to restore. If I can believe for that, then I can believe that God will teach me to worship. I, I, I don't know if I'm even, I haven't gone right down my notes. You'll find them down there. The notes are, they're kind of going along with what I'm saying. But I guess what I want to say to you today, most of all, just deliver my heart to you. Please understand, I love every branch of the church that God created. I love every age group in the church. I love every style of music. I love it all from A to Z. I even like a little bluegrass. I probably draw the line at banjos. <laughs> you know, I kind of feel like juice harps and banjos are all going to be in hell. It's like if I don't make it to heaven, the Lord's going to say, Lake of Fire or the banjo room. <laughs> the fire, please, not the banjos. <laughs> but I don't have all the answers, but what I do know is God is showing me in such a vivid, live way how that we have broken his heart and how that I can start right here with me as a worshiper. You see, I'm called to be a preacher too, but my preaching is not going to mend the heart of God. No matter how good I preach and how much I study, that's not going to fix what's been done to my Lord by people like myself who have ignored him. What's going to help that is to offer myself up to him as a living sacrifice every day and say, Father, I want to worship you today. I want to tell you I love you today. I want to, Lord, in every facet of my life, Lord, help me be a worshiper today. Lord, I, I want to be a good preacher, but I want to be a good worshiper first. And Lord, when I walk into the church, that's what I love another thing about Brownsville. Isn't it funny? You've got the suits over here and you've got the musicians over here. And these guys all dance. Isn't that fun? Because when you have necktie, it's hard to move your neck. So you kind of have to keep a kick. <laughs> but isn't it fun? It look, looks like the Holy Ghost fell in the Republican convention right over here. I would say, the funny, funny one, we were, in, we were in Denver last year, and I mean, God blew up. I mean, just blew up. Uh, second night, we were at Awake America, and we were singing, and we got finished singing, and it was so funny. Hazel is one of our worship leaders. She has a uh, worship singer. She has long brown hair. Her husband, Benny, is the one who plays bass, and, and they have several children, but they're here all the time. It's incredible. She's not here this week because they just had a baby, but she was standing over there, and I walked out there that night to lead worship, and I, you know, Denver is full of a lot of stuff. I mean, there's lots of ooey ooey out there in the spirit, you know. And, and man, when you start to worship, you can feel it, you know, pressing, trying to pull all the, the witchcraft and all the, the New Age stuff in the air just out there trying to wave. So I'm out there just worshiping, and I'm going, this is going nowhere. And the Lord said, sing about the army of the Lord. And I went... I don't know one song about the army of the Lord. I, I don't do those real mad worship songs, you know. I have a tough time getting mad at church. I figure I'll worship, let the Lord fight the battles. It's a lot easier that way. But the Lord said, be militant for a minute and sing. Well, the only, th the only thing I could think of was that old 80s tune that we used to, I hear the sound of the army of the Lord. 
None of the musicians knew it. 8,000 people there. Here comes Foolish Cooley. I start singing it, man. I charge it. I hear the sound of the army of the Lord. I'm stepping out, man. I'm just like all over the stage. And I mean, it's going over like a lead balloon. I mean, boom. The stage is about that high. It was going to the edge of the stage and just wham, right to the floor. So at, I kind of got intimidated. The spirit of, you know, oops. I looked over and the suits weren't into it either, you know, and I'm gone. I'm like, man, I ain't got no support here. This is not good. This is not going good at all. And then all of a sudden, Hazel, who doesn't, who's not real demonstrative, okay, steps out with me on the second course going, She's just going nuts all over and walks out because what the Lord was showing me in the spirit, this is what was happening in the spirit. When I was leading worship, and I don't see a lot of stuff, okay? I'm not really weird. <laughs> but I started, I'm telling you, the Lord, you know the scripture about the valley of dry bones? It came to me just then, and it's like I saw this huge army out there in that auditorium, and they were all laying down. And that this cloud had come over them of oppressiveness and had pressed them down to the point they were in a laying position, a vulnerable position. And that's why God was saying, sing something militant. Sing something to get the troops up. And I knew Hazel saw it too. It was weird because I made eye contact. And she walks out to the edge of the stage and goes, <laughs> like, get up. And I went, oh, boy. Now, at this point, it was only Hazel and I in the whole place that got it. <laughs> you want to feel alone, just get about 8,000 people, about 25 suits over there, and you got you and one lady in the church who's got it. <laughs> Talk about against the odds. <laughs> Woo! And I thought, we look like idiots. I mean, she was jumping. I mean, she here, I mean, here's a lady, you know, and she's got a dress on. <laughs> and I'm just, oh, you know. And it was the worst thing I've ever seen. And finally, both of us just, just gave in to, to, to really, we gave in to just to the intimidation. I just kind of shrunk back, you know, and got over at my keyboard and kind of did this. I just kind of hid and I went, I ended the song like, Just like, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> so Bob walks up to receive the offering. And he gets about right here. And it was this quiet in there. And Bob starts going, <laughs> just shaking. And it looked like somebody threw a grenade in the suits. <laughs> I'm serious. It's like, boom. And Pastor Kilpatrick fell forward. Steve fell sideways. Some of the pastors just reared back in their chairs and they splattered everywhere. And when they saw that happen, the audience went nuts. And it was like little, same thing happened out there. I was going, oh boy, thank God. Thank God something happened. But do you see, it's, 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 it's about worship. It's musicians, it's not about the song. Pastors, yes, let's prepare the song. Don't misinterpret me, please. I'm so tired of being misinterpreted. <laughs> Just please get this. Please rehearse and tune your guitar. Please. And pastors, please prepare a sermon. But when you get to the house of the Lord, or you're at home in your closet, or wherever you're worshiping, forget everything you know. You rehearse, you rehearse, you rehearse, then you forget it. And let God do it. And then you do something stupid like I did last night and make, try to make up a song on the spot. And you, what was that word I rhymed? That was the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But I don't care, you see. Because I just want to be a worshiper. I want to learn to be a worshiper. And I'm going to close with this, but listen to this. Beautiful thing about David. You know that David did four or five. Now, again, this is not a license, so don't go there theologically. But if you notice that David did tons more wrong than Saul did, but Saul got cut off from God much quicker. Why? 
Not because God was making permission a permissive thing because of because David's heart wanted to be right. He failed and blew it, but he had something in him that loved to worship God. Seven times a day, the man would stop what he was doing and worship God. In, in David's reign, the music was playing 24 hours in the, in the temple, and he would walk in there and start singing and writing songs to the Lord. He loved to worship. I'm telling you, pastors, musicians, and I, when I say this, I don't say this just to pastors. I say it to musicians, too. You need to learn to worship God, not music. Don't worship what you do. Don't worship your rehearsal and your great choir song or your great new chorus you've written. Worship God. It doesn't matter if you sing Tweedly Dum. If God wants you to sing Tweedly Dum, sing it and let God use it because God doesn't need clever cliches to move our wonderful three-point and poem sermons. He needs some Somebody who loves him, who will be a worshiper, who will say, Lord, from the dawning of the day till the sun goes down, the name of the Lord will be praised from my, from my lips, from my heart. You will be the Lord of my life, the Lord of my house, the Lord of my children, the Lord of my wife. You will be everything to us. And when we mess up, God will pick ourselves up again and we'll repent with all our heart and we'll go after you even harder. But we will not stop until we have your presence. That's all we want is your presence now I gotta shut up oh Lord I got four minutes let me tell you the last thing here's the last part of this whole thing when you get in that kind of a worship relationship and you just get the I don't cares it suddenly gets easier when you get so in love with Jesus, see, that's what the Lord's calling the church back to, is, oh, Lord. You know what? The old songwriters who wrote, the guy who wrote, oh, for a thousand tongues. I always thought, I, I like the song, but it was a strange thing to say. Oh, for a thousand tongues. I saw a science fiction movie one time, a thing that had a hundred tongues, and I thought, that's the weirdest looking thing. And this guy wants a thousand. <laughs> no. He was so full to worship God. Have you ever been worshiping God to the point that you feel like you're about to blow up and you can't say enough and you can't do enough and you just feel like if, if God gives you any more of him, you're, you're just going to be raptured. I mean, it's, it's over. Your body can't take any more. If you haven't, you need to. If you haven't been there, that's a fun place to be. But that's what the guy was going for. He was going, you know what? I realize as, how, as loud as I can yell the praises of God, as much as I can shout and sing the glory of the Lord, as much as I can lift my hands, as many dances as I can create, that's still only two legs, two hands, one tongue, two eyes, and one mouth. But just like that lady in my, in my neighborhood who it's hard for me to love, if I look at her this way, you know, if I can get her to know Jesus and convert into being a worshiper, then I've got two tongues, four hands, two legs that'll be worshiping. And they'll be worshiping because I talked them into doing it. And I can give that to God. Suddenly soul winning takes on a whole new light. You don't have to worry like, you know, Steve could just move himself to tears over anything. I'm not like that. But suddenly, I can be moved to passion to win the loss for Jesus because I can make worshipers. That means when I stand before the Lord, I can see 10,000 people that maybe the Lord let me win to Him to be worshipers. And every time they lift their hands, it's like me lifting my hands. Every time they shout, it's like me shouting. And it makes everything all different. And you know what? It all starts with going, I don't really know how, God, but if you'll put it here, I'll put it here. If you'll give it here, I'll walk it every day. Oh, isn't that great? Glory. Glory. So, I just want to say one thing in closing. Get free. Just get free. Whatever church you're from, if your church doesn't do that, that's cool. Go home and do it. It'll eventually catch on. Joy is contagious. Laughter is contagious. Pleasing the Lord brings pleasing things on your life. When you please the Lord with worship, everybody around you starts noticing something. 
And it's the things that's done alone in the secretness. I have to get out on my walks. That's when I'm able to talk to the Lord because there's too many, much going on around my house. So I'll take my CD Bible on the thing, you know, and I'll go out and I'll walk for a while. And then I'll get in the park and me and God have Holy Ghost meeting in the park. Thank God nobody drives by. But you got to tell him you love him. Be passionate in love with Jesus. And you don't even have to know how. Just be available. Oh, the Father looks. The Scripture talks about this in my last Scripture. When the Samaritan woman came to Jesus, Jesus said, you know what? You're going up to the mountain to worship. But you know what? There's a time coming that everybody who worships me will worship the Lord in spirit and in truth because this is the kind of worship the Father seeks. And I say, Lord, when you're looking down at Brownsville at this pastor's conference tonight, will you please find worship that's in spirit and in truth? Let it be what you want to hear, oh God, not to impress you, but to bless you because you've been so good. And so wonderful. And so have you. God bless you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you. <laughs> Class dismissed.